So we're almost at coffee. Hang on in there. Um, so this is uh, was originally planned as an open discussion around the preventive campaigns to get and the preventive program to get feedback from um, working group members, country perspectives. But I think this can also be broader as an opportunity to ask some of those questions that were missed earlier. So if you still have those available, um, you feel free to ask them now. And this is designed to be an open discussion with the, the group. So ignore the chairs for this. Um, so just I'm opening it generally to see if people have any feedback on the preventive program, uh, but also any of the questions that weren't addressed earlier. Got the ball rolling. When we talk about preventative campaigns, we are definitely thinking two dose pre planned campaign, right? So probably we're looking out a year or two in terms of just the amount of vaccine we have, or do you think differently? What was the last bit you said? Sorry, Duncan. Or are you thinking differently? I, I mean, to me, it looks like we're probably unlikely to have a lot of preventative two-dose campaigns in 2024, but maybe the community is thinking differently. Yes, yeah, so I think this will be a good one for the group to think about, but um, it also gives me an opportunity to provide some of the thinking around the programmatic piece. So um, we know there's a the period for developing the requests and then the time to review. Um, would you be okay with me saying about nine months in total for like from like or nine to 12 months from starting to having a decision maybe? But I want to reiterate, this is pretty standard for the routine vaccine program. I know it's very different timelines to the reactive piece, but this is normal for planned long-term multi-year planning. And so that that's one thing I wanted to say. And then the other piece is that we're, or at least from my perspective, please jump in if I'm assuming wrong things here, but um, you know, there's no expectation that once you submit, you would get your vaccine within a month, two months. The thinking behind the preventive campaigns is really about high quality coverage and planning. And so, um, as was mentioned earlier by Carol, I think one of the tools we've developed for the preventive campaigns is the OCRA, like, a uh, readiness assessment tool that everyone's probably seen, but just slightly adapted for um, cholera, which Molly actually has been leading. So she's here um, if you want to chat to her about that. But this is a multi, I guess, I think it's six months, Molly, we got it down to or something. We were thinking or six to nine months. Yeah, so it's really about having all those pieces. And this is, again, standard for all the routine campaigns. So it's a very different thinking compared to how we're seeing reactive campaigns being implemented and all of that lead up time is really to make sure everything's in place fundings down to the right levels planning's down whatever you need is down to the lo local levels so that you can achieve the highest uh, coverage possible for your for your doses so it's just a very different approach to what we're seeing with the traditional reactive campaigns um and so even in a no supply issue situation from the time countries are approved, there's probably still going to be this, this period that they should anticipate between receiving approval. And now, and we've also got the supply allocation framework, which we haven't talked about yet, but will be presented tomorrow. So um, while we're in this sort of supply constrained period, um, as with other vaccines that have gone before us recently, um, COVID, yellow fever, malaria, all these frameworks have been developed, which we've built our framework off as well. Um, that help prioritize uh, the amounts that can be given to countries that have been approved. So um, uh, once the kind of process is finalized for that, I'd say it's still up in the air a little bit as to how and when that would be implemented, but probably at least once a year, may maybe twice a year. And so um, 
even after countries have received their approval, there would be this decision on the supply allocation, which would mean the amount you had requested for your first year would be shifted as well. And so then countries would need this pre-planning phase too. So at least 12 months probably from approval in a normal non-supply constrained, well, to the point where we think we can, till we can get um, where we don't have this challenge between reactive and preventive. So I just having that kind of time frame in mind, I think can really help set the stage for how we think about this a bit more. And even in the current situation, I think if we see these big increases in supply, um, you know, we're still finalizing the supply allocation tool that probably won't get triggered until some point next year. And then we should have a few countries hopefully to run through that that have made it through the process so kind of earliest possibility would be the end of next year and if we're thinking it would be until we got to like 100 million before we could consider it it would be more like the year afterwards or something so it's still but even that would not be too far outside the realm of the normal distribution system once we were up and running so Perhaps it's not as dire when we think about it like that as um, as it would be just because of these lead times that we're anticipating to run the campaigns. Um, any other feedback? I mean, that's also my opinion, and I'm sure there are other perspectives. So very open to hear other considerations as part of that. Um, Tang. It's not it's not a different perspective, it's, but it's just to say that, I mean, I think we I work on typhoid, and so typhoid starts with a massive campaign. And there's no country that expects that once they receive their, you know, the go-ahead from Gavi, that all of a sudden 40 million doses of a vaccine are going to arrive in country. We see how difficult it is. So these are planned, and, and you know, and so they'll be approved, and then they start the planning, and then they're going to roll out the following year. So just to say that I know a lot of folks here are working sort of in that emergency mode, and it's really important to work with EPI folks on some of that planning and the readiness assessments. It's about, get, you know, and it's about making sure that there's room in um, the cold chain. I mean, that that's going to also be um, something that's going to restrict uh, when, when campaigns can happen, is when is there room in the cold chain as well. Thanks. Carol? I want to add something to what Tali just said. I will switch in French. Um, L'importance de travailler avec le, le programme PREV est, est crucial parce que le programme PREV a son programme, son plan de travail annuel. Il planifie des campagnes à, à des dates précises. Et si vous ne si vous travaillez pas avec le, le, le PREV, et que vous, vous, vous planifiez une campagne préventive dans un district, vous pouvez vous trouver en même temps dans le district que le, les, les collègues d'immunisation font des campagnes qui ne, sont pas, qui ne peuvent pas être faites en même temps que les campagnes préventives du choléra. Donc, il faut, il faut planifier avec le PEV pour être sûr que vous vous, vous insérez dans une fenêtre où le PEV n'a pas forcément d'activité, ou alors vous insérez dans une fenêtre où le PEV fait aussi une campagne préventive. Dans ce cas, c'est l'intégration. Donc l'intégration, c'est encore un autre travail, parce que l'intégration, ça se, ça se planifie bien plus en avance qu'une campagne en silo. Donc il faut, il faut vraiment travailler avec le PEV pour planifier vos activités de campagne préventive de, du, du choléra. Thank you very much. Um, so Carol just said that it's important for countries to work with the um, EPI so that they can plan together for the campaign so that um, there is no calendar of co conflicts of calendar, things like that. So it's very important to, to do this, to plan together and not working in um, silos. Thank you. Oui, peut-être juste pour apporter... Uh... Ou alors pour, la, pour conforter euh, 
euh, madame, dans ses propos, pour dire que justement, euh, euh, nous, on travaille de façon euh, euh, collégiale avec le père, dans la mesure où euh, déjà, euh, sur le plan logistique, c'est la logistique du PEV qu'on va utiliser. C'est vrai que c'est la logistique du PEV, entre guillemets, mais c'est pour le pays. Donc, il faut qu'il y ait une planification ensemble avec eux pour que, au moment, par exemple, de recevoir des, les, 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 les OCV, qui sont des quantités très énormes, que euh, la chaîne de froid qu'ils utilisent également ne soit pas saturée par euh, euh, leur euh, vaccin. Ça, c'est une chose. L'autre chose également, c'est aussi l'exploitation de tous les documents euh, que l'OPEV a déjà euh, élaborés, sur lesquels nous appuyons fortement, surtout euh, leur situation logistique, le, le rapport de la GEV, le plan de communication, la stratégie nationale de vaccination en cours d'élaboration, euh, le plan de gestion des déchets, qui sont tous des documents qui sont également très importants que nous euh, avons euh, pris au niveau du PEV mais il n'en demeure pas moins leur présence effective également dans les groupes de travail pour pouvoir euh, euh, élaborer ce document. Donc, c'était ce petit commentaire que je voulais également faire à la suite. Merci. All right. So, Dr. Jodidjo said that is he re-emphasized the importance of working together with the EPI so that they can contribute to to the planning um, and so on and so forth. Besides the the conflicts of calendars, they can make technical inputs, and it's very important. Thank you. Um, another aspect to consider is that um, you know we've had three preventative requests already approved through the old GTFCC mechanism and some of them are several years old unfortunately already. We've just had um, you know another country DRC approved re well pr recommended for approval before I get slapped um, uh, and um, you know in the, in the worst case scenario we might see a few years Uh, delay and so there's a question around and Alison you kind of addressed this somewhat in your earlier comment around the flexibility within the envelope but um, you know I I've seen that some countries PAMIs are very much just focused to their endemic regions whereas other countries approaches have been to include epidemic and endemic regions in their hotspots and so we're wondering By the time we get to the point where the vaccine is approved, it, is there going to be a potential scenario or how do we want to kind of manage or think about, do we, will there be a need to kind of reassess where to target that? And my, my feeling is that if the majority of the areas are endemic, it, it should be fine. It might just be a, a small percentage, but just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention or consideration as to how um, how that would be thrown out in the yeah, um, Je vais parler en français. Donc, um, tout à l'heure, Philippe nous a raconté que la, la situation épidémiologique est vraiment en train de changer. Uh, Alison nous a rappelé également que rien n'est sûr par rapport à, aux vaccins pour les campagnes préventives. Euh, étant donné ces, ces facteurs, euh, pour les pays qui ont déjà fait des requêtes préventives, comment est-ce que ce sera géré par rapport euh, au hotspot Est-ce que vous pensez qu'il faudra peut-être contextualiser parce que la situation ne sera peut-être pas la même, ça va évoluer ou pas Rien n'est sûr. Euh, comment est-ce que vous pensez que ce, ça devrait être géré Quels sont les aspects qui pourraient changer Et je vais passer la parole à Dr Placide étant donné que la, le, le, la, le Congo a eu euh, ce leadership dans la submission de requêtes préventives. Merci beaucoup. OK, merci beaucoup. Je crois que avec l'expérience, je crois que si déjà euh, les pays reçoivent le, le vaccin pour la, la préventive, il peut déjà, sur base de, de ces stocks, parce que ce sera parfois les mêmes zones de santé. 
Ça sera sur base de ces stocks-là. On peut maintenant réaménager le, le calendrier comme on l'avait fait les, la période passée. On avait le vaccin pour Bukavu, euh, mais le, il devait intervenir à la phase 2. Mais comme il y avait inondation, on a fait passer cette province à la phase 1 avec ces, ces quantités de vaccins. Donc, cette euh, flexibilité dans la mise en œuvre permet au fait de, de pouvoir économiser ce, ce même vaccin qui, au départ, euh, nous l'avons demandé pour ces zones de santé, mais vu que la situation épidémiologique ou les risques changent, je crois qu'il faut être... Il faut adapter la situation par rapport à ces contextes euh, parce que c'est la même population qui bénéficie de, de ces interventions. Voilà ce que je, je peux dire par rapport à, à cette expérience. Donc, il faut, il faut adapter et tenir compte de la dynamique et de la quantité de vaccins que vous avez pour les mêmes okay. zones de santé qui sont okay. uh, ciblées. Si les vaccins préventifs arrivent, par exemple, dans deux ans, est-ce que vous pensez qu'il faudrait prendre les, les PAMIS? Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Puisque la situation va évoluer, qu'est-ce que vous pensez de, de, de tout ça? Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je crois que le, le PAMIS, c'est une situation qui est faite, une analyse, si elle est bien faite, elle est faite euh, et ça peut couvrir déjà une période de cinq ans. Parce que ça, ça dépend vraiment d'une très bonne analyse. Si on a été vraiment exhaustif, on ne va pas louper le, les zones euh, à risque de choléra lorsque le PAMIS a été fait correctement. Mais s'il si, y, y a des zones qui peuvent connaître flambée, c'est-à-dire il n'est pas dans la caractéristique euh, des zones à risque de choléra. Ça, c'est des flambées euh, qui peuvent arriver et pour lesquelles on peut demander, cette fois-là, la, la, la vaccination réactive et mettre en place toutes les autres interventions. C'est le cas de, de, de chez nous. Donc, les zones endémiques, on, on les connaît, c'est-à-dire que chaque année, chaque semaine, c'est des zones qui, qui ont des cas de manière permanente. Mais les zones à caractère épidémique sont des zones qu'on connaît aussi. Ils peuvent faire trois ans, quatre ans, il n'y a pas de cas. Et si ça arrive, ce n'est pas qu'on va revisiter les PAMI parce que cette zone de santé a fait une épidémie. Donc, la, la, la connaissance de, de son épidémie, donc de, de sa situation et de, de la situation du pays, fait que quand vous avez votre PAMI pour cinq ans, vous pouvez espérer être dans les limites, mais tout en faisant face à des flambées qui peuvent migrer dans d'autres dans d'autres districts. Thank you, Dr. Placid. So we would like to hear from other countries, especially the countries that have submitted their preventive request. What do you think should be done, um, given that our uh, The OCV might not come that early. What should be done about the, the PAMIs? Should we consider endemic, hotspot, epidemic together? Uh, perhaps we can hear from Bangladesh, who we'll just submitted as well. And as I mentioned, this is more about like a worst case scenario where we've got multiple years difference between when the PAMIs were initially done and then, um, and I guess really touches on that if some of the areas included were not all endemic. Uh, but just general, I think feedback really around the burden of work and what the perspective you think would be from the country around that. Um, Abhishek is willing to, uh, or JP. Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, and uh, we also received those questions uh, internally. Uh, and the answer that we normally give, and it's true, is that we made the PAMIs not only to to identify areas for vaccination, 
but for other intervention. So uh, uh, not counting that we will not get the vaccines, but also seeing how to, to uh, multiply intervene on that area and also uh, bring, bring a short term, long term, medium term and long term solution. So uh, our strategy is exactly that. So uh, we have identified this whole hotspot. We have done also the, the capacity analysis in terms of the conditions for each province or each area to contain possible outbreaks or possible situation, epidemic or endemic situation, and then have the sectors, different sectors, making specific plans and the vaccination plan uh, specifically follows under the Minister of Health, but the Minister of Public Works, they also have the specific plans and they're also talking with different partners to, 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 to move on with that plan uh, during the, 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 the timeline that we have. So uh, 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 considering this uh, variability, so everything will support to accomplish this objective of eliminating or reducing or control cholera for, for, for the coming period. So this is uh, uh, the thought that we are using and uh, in all, all our documents are, are connected with one another. The, the elimination plan is connecting, it's connected with the vaccination plan. It's connecting with the GTFCC roadmap, the research agenda. So to exactly to have uh, multiple layers of intervention and ju not just follow in one pillar of intervention. Thank you very much. Does Bangladesh have a comment? Sorry, Abhishek. First of all, Bangladesh is very optimistic that we'll have the vaccine. <laughs> So just one thought, like not answer to this question, but like what is the thought like of this global community when the world is going through this crisis of vaccine and there is a country who have their own vaccine approved in their own country? Can that vaccine be given to the same country, if not to other countries? Just food for thought for this group to consider. <laughs> like I know like WHO, PQ and everything, but that vaccine has already been given by some local NGOs, INGOs, even by the government to at certain point. So is it right time to think like, because there are such several studies on non-inferiority trials, this and that, which is showing like that vaccine is equivalent to Sankol. So is it, I'm just putting a question, food for thought, for the prestige esteemed group to think and like because the world is going to this crisis and we are saying vaccine 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 there is a company sitting give me order so anyways so coming back to your question definitely like it's quite obvious the hot spot will change if it is like two years down we don't get anything it like and that we have also seen moving forward and i do believe like gavi is flexible enough like if we are saying after two years like okay even in the proposal we have put like this and the country say okay maybe we are not changing the ceiling we are not doing this but we instead of prioritizing a area we want to do first vaccination in b area because we are seeing that is our thing and from now if we get the first dose in 2025 maybe i am I'm crossing my fingers, we are sure like we might have one or two outbreaks here and there. And maybe it has already, uh, the one of the hotspot or a couple of hotspot have already got the reactive campaign. I, I don't know, in DRC, now they have got those doses for reactive campaign. How many of those are also part of their preventive campaign as well? So what will, how they are going to address that? And I'm sure that there must be several overlaps around that so there will be because we are planning long so there will be some adjustment on the way going forward and bangladesh is also considering every three years we'll have a relook on our hotspot like how it changes and accordingly we will adjust the plan but we will 
be mindful that we are not changing the ceiling so the overall plan is not disturbed but and also we are looking at the same flexibility like we should not go through a long cumbersome process okay resubmit your plan then countries will not be flexible they will put a fully stop okay these are the things hotspot or not hotspot we are doing it here but if it is much less cumbersome process okay if you have change in hotspot like 10 percent 15 percent you just do this two page uh, deviation from the plan submit to us we'll approve it and you can go ahead that might facilitate for us to better utilize the resource uh, moving forward if we see that a uh, big gap between now to actual receiving of the vaccine by the country oh yeah uh I'm conscious we're close to coffee break, but I want to I want to give everyone time to do and I you sure? Um I want, also wanted to come back to Duncan's original question, because of course I had a follow-up thought that I didn't mention. Um one thing we've been well I've been wondering, and again it would be once we've got a bit more confidence in the supply, maybe, is that countries who have approved preventive campaigns that are in this situation that Abhishek was just describing, where they've done a first dose, um, is would it be possible, and again, there's all sorts of other issues around timing of when we can get that second dose to them, that it would function as a second dose, but is there an opportunity to have the second dose supplied through the kind of preventive mechanism um, for those countries that have been approved through um, the work that they've been doing as well? But that's, again, many pieces to it and it was one of the discussions we didn't get to earlier about what evidence do we have available for sh um, informing this kind of six month practice that we have to limit when we can to when we restart the first dose again um, but something for the the group to to think about as well as we're trying to address um, how we can sort of trigger some of these preventive purchase orders too um, but did you still want to comment In Bangladesh setting, predict, uh, uh, preventive and epi, um, out, um, what do you say, reactive is so difficult to separate. In 2020, we did some sites that were preventive, and those were a few of those sites were again vaccinated and reactive. So you can understand what the situation is. Thank you. We are going to hear from Philip. Very quick, very but from what we have seen so far, I mean the proportion and uh, uh, we have the figure somewhere, but the proportion of the uh, in the country that have submitted requests, including DRC or Ethiopia, uh, that have approved requests of uh, area that are targeted for preventive vaccination is relatively small. The outbreak started there, but then spread outside. So, so it's not that you know that all the. Uh, um, the, the issue is to stop the spread so in the current situation so um, so the thing which I think would be important and I think you mentioned it it's the flexibility I mean of course if a country has to come in five years with a totally different plan <laughs> there was a problem somewhere but uh, to to have a, a level of flexibility that some of maybe some few hotspot would have that were kind of lower grade hotspots that were not I mean that could have been targeted for other intervention but not for vaccination could be included uh, you know so so this kind of flexibility not not change I mean changing not changing the, the quantity but to give the, the the capacity for the country to allow for some flexibility uh, and adaptation to the evolving situation uh, I, I don't think that would be a problem, I guess. Voilà. Thank you. Just a quick to clarify on that. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about changing areas if needed from a Gavi perspective. I think, you know, we don't provide technical guidance. So I think it's this group to say what makes sense, the country to say this is what we need to do. 
you know, if there's a big change in amount of money, that's when that's when there needs to be some review. But otherwise, if it's an epidemiological need, if it's a shifting, if, if there's a reason, then it, it's not a complicated thing. The other thing we need to consider in the next couple of years is the expanded uh, testing that's probably going to happen and how that may change countries' decisions about where to be vaccinating and, and things like that. So I think we should anticipate that again and sort of think among us here of how we want to advise in those situations. Thank you, Alison, for the interesting perspective. So we move to Martins and then we wrap up. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. My question, um, Philip, I've started answering it already. Is a build off to what uh, Bagladif said. Uh, if, if you look at the environmental factors that are coming up now, you see that if I don't know how many countries have submitted their plan, but I know when I was in Ethiopia and we did our hotspotting, if we are to redo it now, it's going to change drastically. To change. So I don't know this flexibility because, of course, the funding will be affected. There's no way you, 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 you're going to uh, look away from the funding. So I, I don't know how much flexibility you're going to, uh, that is there, especially when it comes to the preventive. And that another aspect is when will this preventive come in? Because most countries are, are responding to cholera throughout the year. So the reactive is on. And if you look at the preventive, some of those areas that have been, that are, that are under react, uh, reactive campaign are also, uh, pen down for preventive campaign. So the, the, uh, it still comes down to supply issues, comes down to logistics issues, and also how flexible this plan is supposed to be. We're talking about five years, but we don't have five years. We're talking about the changes could be six months, could be nine months. Uh, if, for example, if you look at the map of Kenya for El Nino, it's totally different completely different from what we have in terms of the hotspotting that we did last year for the vaccination, whether it's preventive or reactive. So all these issues, you know, it's just a lot of discussion have to go in, a lot of point out. Because at the end of the day, you still have to come back to the country's priorities. But if the country priority is not <laughs> matching the TTFCC or ICG priority based on their planning that they have or based on the funding available, I don't know. Can I ask a question to that? If your hotspots are changing that rapidly, for the multi-year plan, do you know how many are endemic? And I know it's, I'm looking at Catherine because I know she helps do that uh, for Kenya, but um, I wondered if you can comment on um, how many, like the endemicity in some of these hotspots versus there being um, epidemic hotspots where they're, they're not seeing it. Because really, I think for the preventive, the focus is really, uh, on those areas that are seeing cholera every year so we can try and stop it happening in these places. Um, but I don't know if, if yourself or, or Catherine behind you can comment on that. So. Yeah, I'll give it to Catherine, but I understand what you're trying to say, but you can see that the environmental factors are changing and some of these areas, they were not endemic like we classified it before. But if you look at the drought, uh, the drought situation that is going on, especially in Kenya and those areas, those areas used to be maybe surrounding maybe the camps, but now it's moving out and it's staying there for a long, it's for a longer period, despite the uh, the massive intervention going on there. So it's now heading towards endemicity because there's no water there. We don't know when water is going to come. Now, the water is coming <laughs> with El Nino, but we're not talking about flooding also. So whichever way, you, whichever way we look at it epidemiologically, and if you look at the environmental, these things are going to, last longer than we expect. I don't know what the calculation for adversity will be in this case. So that's an example of how it is that I know. Katrin, you want to add? You have to support me. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, just a quick comment about uh, the need to be flexible as at the time when the vaccines become available compared to when the request was submitted. I think in our poster outside, you'd be able to see that some of the areas that were affected by the 2022-23 outbreak are the areas that were previously mapped as hotspots in the 2015 to 2019 data. 
but there are also new areas that were not in the hotspot map. So as at the time when that uh, vaccine is available, there could be some difference. I don't think I can quantify and say what percentage would have had change. And as you said, there are so many other contextual factors that, like the population dynamics, the drought situation, the flooding or lack of, I mean, the flooding, the lack of water. For Kenya, there's also lack of pasture other than water because that population uh, that is high risk is predominantly pastoralist and they have to move within the country and also beyond the country. So I think the flexibility issues will, will have to be considered. But um, the other Kenyan colleague can add on if I missed something. Yeah, I think uh, the question, if you asked me, the uh, colleagues have uh, given a perspective of the changing hotspots in the country. Although, fundamentally, if you went for some traditional areas, you'd, uh, you'd actually limit uh, what is happening outside because they are largely as a result of uh, urbanization around traditional hotspots. So you deal with the epicenters around there, you may still be able to have some impact. Uh, but the challenge which will be coming from our end, and maybe this some um, we need some experience from the countries that have been uh, uh, conducting the campaigns, is um, what are the reinfection rates in some of these places when you don't vaccinate after maybe some years? Because again, we don't want to have a situation where people be, start believing that uh, OCV is not effective. We may not have explained to them that it's only the duration is short. Eh? So after some time when people start getting reinfected, they're going to have uh, negative attitudes around the OCV. So probably as we consider preventive, we should look around that. Um, and my final question, if um, if production can be assured to some level, do we need to really wait for two years? Why can't we start with whatever is available and allocate it pro rata based on risk? Thank you very much. Um, any other person? Let's hear from Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to give my perspective um, with my surveillance working group hat. When we developed the PAMI guidance, the idea was not to be revising this guidance every year. The idea is that, you know, if you're revising guidance every year and it takes a year to over a year to request and plan for a preventive campaign, and then, you know, by the time you're about ready to request, you revise the hotspots, you're just in an endless cycle of always redoing your analysis, always needing to convince people that these are the right places to vaccinate. So really, I would encourage people to think about, you know, using the PAMIs for preventive purposes and not revising just because there is a, a, an outbreak that, that changes the situation. The idea is, at least from my perspective, you know, there's the reactive campaign uh, thread and there is the preventive campaign thread, we should be staying the course as long as we don't think there is a serious, serious change in the epidemiologic situation. We should be staying the course when there's the preventive campaign usage and you use the reactive campaign request mechanism for outbreaks and, and not change the, all of the PAMI analysis um, every time there's a, a, an outbreak that occurs. And I think it is really hard because, you know, you're you're sort of blurring the line between, you know, being responsive to the situation right now, but also trying to do long term planning. And I recognize that part of the situation right now is driven by the lack of vaccine. So you're trying to get vaccine by any mechanism possible. But I think, you know, when we get to a situation where there is a, a slightly more expanded supply and, and countries are able to meet those needs. Ideally, we would be kind of sticking to the reactive thread for outbreaks and staying the course with the PAMIs that are identified over a relatively long period of time. 
And just as a reminder, some of the indicators that we're using to identify PAMIs are, are over long periods of time, right? So we're thinking about mean annual incidents over five to 10 to 15 years. So if there is, for example, El Nino cycles that are coming every 10 years, if you had that historical data and looked over that 10 year period, may, ideally some of those places would have been captured within your PAMI analysis. It shouldn't be something new and unexpected. So I just wanted to, to give a little bit, that, bit of that perspective. I, I, I mean, I'm relatively new to this group, so I don't know what you've been discussing in the past, but I really think this is not something where we should be changing our hotspot analysis every year to accommodate what new outbreak has, has come up that last year. Thank you very much. So we are going to wrap up. Um, in conclusion, um, we've heard that we might need some flexibility considering environmental and epidemiological factors. Uh, again, we are reminded that we have to stick to either the, the reactive mechanism or the preventive mechanism. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful contributions.